My name is Francis Leach. I'm the host of today's uh, Redline podcast, Twitter Spaces Conversation. I'm the head of Breaking News with the Redline podcast, and uh, I'm uh, really grateful that you could uh, all be here for this important conversation about the situation that's unfolding in Pakistan. We are awaiting one or two uh, other of our speakers to join us, and we might get things underway, though, while we've got a couple of people here who have been invited to speak uh, on this very particular issue, which over the last uh, 12 weeks or so, uh, Pakistani politics has been in great turmoil. And for those of us looking on from outside, it's sometimes difficult to understand all the nuances and uh, the consequences of what's been happening. And that is the point of this evening or today's Red Line Spaces podcast. Can I just introduce some of our speakers to you who are joining us here tonight? Firstly, Michael Kugelman joins us. Michael is Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia with the Wilson Centre. Uh, Michael, welcome to Twitter Spaces and welcome to the Red Line podcast, uh, Twitter Spaces conversation on Flashpoint Pakistan. Thank you. Great to be here with you again. Thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate your time. Sahi, uh, Saha Khan joins us as well. Saha is a research fellow at the Cato Institute for Defence and Foreign Policy. Uh, her research interests include uh, state-sponsored militancy and terrorism, terrorism counter-terrorism policies as well. Saha, thank you very much for being part of our conversation too. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's, I'm excited about this. Thank you for being here. Michael Hilliard is the host of the Redline podcast and uh, Michael is with us in conversation uh, today as well. The latest edition of the Redline podcast has uh, just been released this week. Michael, welcome. Now, before we get into this conversation, do you want to give us a, a quick plug, a quick spruik for what this particular uh, edition of the podcast is about? Uh, well, the last podcast we just did was on uh, aircraft carriers uh, and they are they becoming obsolete. Uh, you know, some of these aircraft carriers are incredibly expensive. Uh, but right now, let's talk about Pakistan. Uh, we actually have done a, a recent piece on Pakistan, which I think Michael and both Sahar were both involved in, uh, focusing on Balochistan uh, and a, that relationship with the rest of the country. So you can check that out. But for now, I'm uh, yeah just here to, to talk some foreign policy, and I'm just as excited to hear uh, Sahar and Michael and, and what Henry have to say on this one as uh, they're usually my go-to source for information on uh, Pakistan and what's happening in this area of the world. Okay, well, let's have that conversation. Derek Henry Flood should join us very soon. If he's not already in the space, I can't see him. Michael, can you see him somewhere here, or am I missing him at the moment? That's all right. I'm chasing him down at the moment. All good. Okay, we'll get into that in a sec. So, let me start with you. From the outside, the last two and a half, three months have been particularly volatile in terms of the stability of Pakistani politics. Can you give us a bit of background leading up to, to recent events with Imran Khan? I'm sure. Um, and thanks, everyone. And especially for those of you um, listening, I really appreciate um, you coming into the space and hearing um, Michael, myself and, and our other guests here. So just a really brief history of um, sort of Imran Khan and why he finds himself in this predicament now. Basically, in April, he was ousted from parliament with a no confidence vote. Um, and this is something that he fought. And basically, um, you know, Pakistan is a parliamentary democracy, which basically means that you have a coalition government. And even though he had won the general election in 2018, he had to form a coalition. And, and that's how he was, was governing. There were some grievances within his coalition. A lot of his coalition members felt that Imran Khan weren't necessarily listening to him or taking their interests into account as well. And basically, few members of, the, of his coalition went to the opposition, which ended up giving opposition enough seats or enough enough votes to to start a no confidence vote. Um, Imran Khan tried to fight it and um, he fought it by dissolving parliament, which is his his right, according to um, the constitution. The opposition fought it and the case went to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court ruled that once a no confidence vote begins, a sitting prime minister cannot stop it. And so what Imran Khan essentially did was was unconstitutional. So parliament basically met in an emergency meeting, did a no confidence vote and and out and ousted him, essentially. And now we have a new prime minister uh, or an interim um, prime minister anyway, Shabazz Sharif. Um, now, Imran Khan, of course. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just saying that Imran Khan, of course, you know, hasn't been sitting quietly. He's been rallying all over the country. He's been pushing the opposition to do early elections. Um, and in his rallies, he's been saying a lot of 
things, um, some true, some not true, some criticisms, some misinformation. And that's basically what's gotten him in the hot seat with the army and, um, and with the police as well. And he was charged with terrorism for inciting um, violence and, and hate um, on Sunday. And now I think he's, uh, he should be appearing in front of an anti-terrorism court soon. And Michael, is it not true that this is the first time a, 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 a no-confidence vote has been used in this way to change power in Pakistan? Yes, uh, well, thanks for having me. And I should also just say that my thoughts are with, uh, with Pakistanis uh, today who are affected by these horrific floods, which appear to have could be one of the worst natural disasters the country has faced. Um, but to your, to your question, uh, yes, I believe this is the first time that it, a no confidence, that a, an attempt to uh, oust a prime minister through a no confidence vote has succeeded. And why that is the case, I mean, various factors. Um, I think that it comes down to a perfect storm of opportunities for the opposition at the time. Um, the opposition alliance, when Imran Khan was in power, had been trying to capitalize on uh, rising prices and economic troubles, but it wasn't really getting anywhere. It was able to hold some pretty big rallies at one point, but wasn't getting the traction that they that the, the opposition coalition would have wanted. But then... Um, Imran Khan had a falling out with the army chief over the issue of um, who would be the next head of the uh, of the ISI, the spy agency, and the succession process that went with that. And that led to a spat um, between Khan and the army chief. And I think when the opposition saw that, it, it sensed an opportunity and it pounced. And um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that the opposition's efforts to ram through that no confidence vote received the support of at least the army chief and maybe others uh, within the military. And so, you know, we know that in Pakistan, when you have the army chief's backing in the political sphere, uh, that's rarely going to hurt you. I mean, there are exceptions, but I think that that is probably one of the reasons why there was, why you actually had a successful effort to oust a uh, prime minister through the no confidence vote, the fact that the army chief was, was behind the move. Derek Henry Flood is an independent editor, writer and photojournalist who has uh, done a lot of work in the M Middle East, Central and South Asian uh, issues and affairs. Uh, his specialty and Derek uh, is with us now. Uh, Derek Henry Flood, just to you, just what sort of legitimacy does uh, the Shabazz Sharif uh, uh, new government have with ordinary Pakistanis? What are we understanding about what the status of, their, of, of this new government is within the wider community and, and the wider population? You might need to take yourself off mute if you. <laughs> if, uh, Dan, there How's we go. That? We've got okay. you. Welcome to the welcome <laughs> to the Twitter space. Okay, no worries. Um, so, as listeners may know, Shabazz Sharif is the brother of the former Prime Minister uh, Nawaz Sharif, um, and is head of the Pakistan Muslim League Dash Nawaz, owing to um, owing to Nawaz Sharif, and basically, it's sort of a I view Shabazz Sharif as being in power now in the wake of uh, Khan's ouster in April as kind of a retrenchment into Pakistan's sort of traditional sort of what, what are known in South Asia as vote bank politics, which is that there is sort of like a, a dominant party in Punjab, a dominant party in Sindh, a dominant party in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, and so forth. And in, I think, where why Khan's... Um, prime ministership had been so important is that he with his celebrity status from uh, from cricket uh, winning the world cup in 1992 and thereafter he kind of he was a, a national sport hero who then became a, um, a he transformed that into um, becoming a political icon and to put it in today's kind of tech jargon Khan is a political disruptor because he disrupted the the traditional politics of the Pakistan People's Party, the PPP of the Bhutos and Zardaris, uh, the Pakistan Muslim League of the the uh, Sharifs, both uh, Nawaz and Shabazz. And I think with his Pakistan Tariq and Saf, he had created a, a political movement that was a bit more holistic. It wasn't so much provincial-based. Um, Imran Khan is a what is known as a Punjabi Patan, which is that he's he's a Pashtun, but who uh, whose family are from um, a settled area of, Punj of what is now Punjab province. And so Khan could, 
he could play both the Patan card in terms of whether it was the, the drone strikes that were going on um, in the federally administered tribal areas in the Obama years, but he also had the political legitimacy in Punjab, which is uh, Pakistan's demographic heartland. And so I think what he had what he had done was actually unique in Pakistan's political history um, in post-1947 and post-1971. And so his ouster is kind of an earthquake because he had built he had built upon something that w ha hadn't really been done uh, in Pakistan's post-colonial political life. I think Francis is a... Yeah, I know. Uh, it's me that's on yep. mute. Indeed. Sorry about yep. that. Thank you, Michael. I was just going to say, can you explain to us what uh, Imran Khan's wider political philosophy or economic philosophy or appeal was to the wider Pakistani population, given the disparate interest that Derek pointed out in terms of cultural and tribal difference? What was his overarching appeal to ordinary Pakistanis? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Imran Khan, you know, appeals especially to the country's youth a lot. Um, Pakistan has a youth bulge, which basically means that um, I think the, the last uh, UN um, DP report showed that about 64% of the population was between the ages of of 19 and, and 34. So, um, you know, Pakistan is a very sizable youth population and they really like Imran Khan. Um, they see him as somebody who has been able to succeed. He is not a feudal. He has gained his fame um, by being an international cricket star. He gained his fortune that way as well. And then he used it to create Pakistan Tariqa Insaf and um, also to, um, you know, he built a hospital called Chakathanam, which is a, a really great cancer hospital. So he's been doing a lot of charity work and, and political work and and a lot of it has been um, geared towards improving Pakistan. And the youth kind of kind of like that as well. His second appeal has been that he has been critical of various um, parts of Pakistan's foreign policy and economic policy as well. So just speaking on foreign policy, he has criticized past governments for relying too much on the United States, for um, catering to, too much to U.S. needs, especially in the global war on terror. Um, and he was very, very critical of drone strikes and how the U.S. has used Pakistan's bases for its drone wars, especially in Afghanistan. On the economic side, he was he was very critical when he was on the campaign trail of Pakistan um, going to the IMF and the World Bank for all kinds of loans. And he had vowed that he, he was going to make some structural changes. Of course, you know, when you're on the campaign trail versus when you're in, in office, those are two very different uh, things. And so his administration did go to the IMF because Pakistan needs the loans. The, the economy is in pretty bad shape. Um, and, and so his criticism, some of it is valid. Some of it is just a little bit of showmanship. But people like him because he is more or less honest compared to the other politicians. And by honest, I don't simply mean, oh, he you know um, doesn't lie or he doesn't take bribes or anything like that. Um, the previous... The current Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, and this is something Derek mentioned, he's the brother of Nawaz Sharif, who was Prime Minister of Pakistan twice, and he has been banned from running for office because of corruption. So corruption is a big problem. Um, the Puttos are notorious, uh, who are the head of the uh, Pakistan People's Party, are also notorious for being corrupt. Asif Ali Zardari, who was um, uh, the Prime Minister in the first election in 2008, his nickname was Mr. 10%. Because um, basically, you know, he was was known for taking bribes. So yeah, I mean, it's it, corruption Bye -bye. is a big problem, um, and and that's why you know it's been it's been an issue. But but Imran Khan is seen as non-corrupt and as somebody who um, really understands Pakistan's youth. Uh, Michael Klugelman, can we talk a little bit about the role of the Pakistani military establishment in? the relationship with Imran Khan, because one of the criticisms of Khan's uh, time as prime minister was that he wasn't elected, but he was selected. That was a common theme that was often leveled at him, that he was selected by the Pakistani military establishment to be the prime minister. And there was a way of trying to delegitimize him. How true is that? And, and what sort of impact has that had? So just before Michael uh, starts speaking, I'll, I'll just get Derek, if you could just mute yourself. Uh, just between uh, questions, just so we can keep the audio clean. Uh, and I'll actually, I'll let Michael Kugelman take this one. I think this is uh, right up his alley for, for knowledge on the Pakistani military. 
Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, as, as a general rule uh, in Pakistan, when civilian um, figures uh, want to rise to the very top of politics, you really need to have the backing of the military uh, to an extent. So, you know, if you go way back, uh, you could go be well, well beyond Imran Khan. You can go back to others. Many forget, given his eventual spats with the military, that Nawaz Sharif, who, of course, was one of uh, Imran Khan's um, predecessors, Nawaz Sharif at one point was very close to the military. He was very close to Zia al Haq. Um, and that helped elevate him to a great high political status. But, um, you know, with Imran Khan, when he first emerged uh, in, in the realm of politics, when he formed his party in the 1990s, uh, he was very slow to, to gain traction. I mean, obviously, because of his celebrity status, as was discussed before, he was a household name, and that really helped. And also his, his incessant focus, for, for good reason, in my view, on corruption and countering it was something that helped draw him a lot of public support early on. But um, he, you saw what happened in 2008 and 2009 when you had this major uh, democracy movement uh, in Pakistan against the military rule of Pervez Musharraf. Imran Khan was right in the middle of that. He was a big critic of Pervez Musharraf at the time. So he was not exactly in the best graces of the military early on. But indeed, as the years went on, um, he did indeed start to uh, slowly uh, uh, develop better relations with with the military and 2013 election which he did not win but he would contest quite often from the sidelines in the opposition it was at that point where his relations with the military i would argue began to gain traction and strength to the point that indeed in the 2018 election he may not have received direct support from the military i do not believe the i don't support the narrative that he was quote selected he had strong public support um, at that point, he didn't. He, it's not like he could only have become prime minister because the military put him in that spot. He did enjoy significant levels of public support, particularly within uh, from some pretty significant significant constituencies. As Sahar mentioned, you know, young, uh, urban, uh, tech savvy voters. That that's a critical constituency that he was able to get a lot of support from that earlier on. But indeed. Um, he was in a better position uh, with the military in, in 2018, and the military did um, engage in what one could describe as pre-electoral machinations in terms of convincing certain uh, politicians to change parties and pushing for um, the speeches of and messaging of certain political leaders that were opposed to Imran Khan not to receive airtime. In other words, there were things that were done subtly that ended up benefiting Imran Khan. Uh, now, it is in some ways surprising that Imran Khan would be seen as a favorite son by the military, which he was for quite some time, in that he doesn't fit the mold of what the Pakistani army would like to see a civilian um, political leader and prime minister be. I mean, he's not willing to defer. He's got a strong personality. And yet the army prefers to have pliant, uh, malleable, deferential prime ministers. And that was not the case with Imran Khan. But you did have for the, the three, the, the, the years that he was in power as prime minister, what's been described as a hybrid system in which he and other civilian figures in the government essentially shared power with the military to an extent. Um, and as I had said earlier, it was only later on uh, last year when he had that tiff, which had been a rare spat with the army chief over the issue of the next ISI leader. And that's when things went south. But I would say that the army is not a monolith. And it would be wrong to say that um, uh, the entire military institution turned against Imran Khan. That's not it at all. Uh, and if you look at this more broadly in, in the context of this, the wider security establishment, the former ISI leader, Faiz Hamid, um, who some see as a potential next army chief, um, you know, he had been very close to Imran Khan for quite some time. And there's no reason to think that he's turned against Imran Khan. So I do think it's important that when we look at the that civil military relations in the context of Imran Khan, that it's important to look at the, the army not as a monolith. And even today, I'm quite sure there are some factions high up in, in the military that um, continue to support him, others that, that may not. Uh, but it would be wrong to say that the army on the whole turned against him. Uh, Derek, can we try and understand a little bit about where this cleave in the relationship that Michael has given a very sophisticated uh, portrait of uh, just just then between Imran Khan and the military started to open up over the uh, transfer of power to the next di director general of the ISI, the Intelligence Service, in October of 2021. 
who were the who were the personalities involved or the people involved? And, and do we have an understanding of was it a philosophical difference or was it a, a pure power politics uh, uh, confrontation here where we saw, saw a, a difference of opinion and difference of approach which has led to this schism? Um, I think, I mean, without being within, in the halls of the ISI HQ in, in Raul Pindi, it's probably, you could probably only speculate on what the, the, the precise uh, particulars are. I think um, sort of in, in, the, in, in sort of a broader context, um, Khan in his, in his sort of his political path beginning in the mid-1990s after he formed uh, PTI, portrayed himself as as Sahar and and I think Michael have uh, have indicated he, he's portrayed himself as this so he was kind of this outsider who was a populist and he was what he tried to create was a super provincial political movement which was something that was not particular to Lahore or Peshawar or Quetta or Karachi and so forth and at the beginning, he, I think, uh, as Michael was indicating, in um, as far as like the the drone strike program that was going on, when I encountered Khan um, in when he was campaigning in Lahore in 2008, he was actually railing against the Pakistani establishment at the time, which is sort of uh, code code for the ISI uh, and the army top brass, because he felt that the Pakistani military establishment was was totally in league with the United States and the war on terror in both um, the federal, uh, both the Fatah and in Eastern Afghanistan. And so he, it, it's con, kind of navigated this very difficult um, kind of uh, riverine path through to, to where he actually ended up becoming allied with the ISI and allied with the military. And I think in that, in, in sort of that longer context from say, the mid to late 2000s until earlier this year, it's not improbable to think that Khan could have had a major falling out with these kinds of figures because he didn't start his political career as somebody who they who was anointed by them by any stretch of the imagination. Khan railed against the, the establishment politics of the PPP, uh, the, the, PL, the PM, uh, PM Ella uh, Nawaz, and so forth. And so... I think where we are today with what happened with him uh, in early April, it wasn't an inevitable outcome. Now, I know there are a number of people uh, who are listening in to our conversation uh, here today who would like to speak, but there's one person who has joined us who I have invited to join us in conversation for here. Idris is, uh, is amongst our uh, listeners today, and she's a journalist and primetime host and anchor of News Edge, one of the... Uh, major television channels in, in Pakistan. So for here, if you've got our invitation and, and want to join the conversation, um, I don't know if you're seeing or hearing us at the moment, but we'd love to hear from you. If you can uh, use your microphone in the bottom left-hand corner of your phone there. But I, in, in the uh, interim, I want to go to Michael Hilliard and get a, a wider uh, strategic picture of what the current unrest in Pakistan looks like to its near neighbours and how that they might have been responding to current events there, Michael? I mean, the, a lot of the problems Pakistan is going through are, are throughout the region. I think, you know, uh, you know, Michael and, and Sahar put it really well about the military as well, that whilst it is in the military, it picks things, they do put their thumb on the scale at times. But to, you know, Pakistan right now is facing 21% inflation from last year. You know, cost of living has gone through the roof. Resources are really hard to get a hold of. Uh, grain is a problem. The Chinese uh, investments are not, you know, building up as people thought they would. They are kind of levelling out, particularly in the south. Uh, it's just not a good economic situation in Pakistan. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, you know, a lot of people assumed that when the Taliban came to power, that Pakistan would either have this great relationship with them or be able to work in partnership, and that hasn't been the case. In fact, uh, Kabul's, you know, not to give it a definition, but has been very, very conciliatory with with New Delhi over over Islamabad. Uh, Iran is still in its own uh, world at the moment, effectively, uh, but we are seeing more and more. Uh, people start to open that door to Iran again. Uh, so that may indicate that we will, uh, you know, see Iran effectively gain power. Afghanistan is not in a good position, to put it mildly. Uh, India is making better relations with Afghanistan. And the people that are, so the, the 
country that everyone looked to to really bail Pakistan out financially, which is China, is itself having a whole slew of financial problems at the moment. So it's it's a pretty rough situation for Pakistan. But I also don't think this is a completely to you know just isolate Pakistan. This is a pretty wide. Uh, regional problem that even into Central Asia, particularly, there's just so much cost of living process and problem up there. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 I don't think it mattered too much, you know, if who was on the throne at the moment or, you know, what was going on. People were not going to be happy uh, due to the fact that we're looking at 21% inflation in the, in the majority of the country. And that's pretty hard to swallow, even if you're the most diehard Sharif or diehard uh, Imran Khan fan. Uh, Faria Idris is with us. We're so glad that she joined our Twitter Spaces conversation today uh, and she can give us first-hand experience of uh, what's been happening in Pakistan. And, and a sense, Faria, thank you for, for joining us and we're really glad that you could could speak with us. A sense of what young Pakistanis are expecting uh, from their government and, and why Imran Khan might have had such a particular appeal to people who otherwise were disengaged or disillusioned with uh, Pakistani politics. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak and a big hello to everyone, special Michael Kuhlman. I saw an interesting panel and that's why I thought I would like to listen into the conversation. So thank you very much. Um, I think you're referring to what I wrote um, in the comments section. And this is something that I've been saying for a very long time because I've been covering Imran Khan's rallies and um, uh, other political parties' rallies for a long time now. And I was present there when uh, Imran Khan's huge uh, rally in, on 30th October in 2011, I think, took place when he actually uh, became a, a, a force to reckon with. And when I was in the crowd and I was at um, Minare Pakistan, I was speaking to a lot of people what I realized was that there was a whole group of people in that crowd which had never been uh, to any rally before. Uh, there were a lot of women, um, and that is about almost 10 years ago that I'm talking about. Now the political scenario has changed, but that was just the beginning of the change at that time. And I was um, a relatively young reporter at that time. When I came back, it was my editors who looked at what I had brought, and they said, look, we, this is different. This is phenomenal. The people who are now coming to these rallies, who are participating in politics, we haven't seen this before. And this is how it started slowly. There was also a lot of disillusionment for these people, especially when Khan did come uh, to power. They thought that he made a lot of compromise and there were a lot of ideological people who were involved in this politics. But what had happened, like to understand what I'm saying is you have to look at Pakistani politics before Imran Khan. And before Imran Khan, it was a two-party system. One party will come and then the other party will come. And that is also before 18th Amendment. And one party will mostly be removed um, allegedly by the military on allegedly corruption charges. And then the second party will come and they will make exactly the same charge against the previous party. And the same thing will happen again and again. So we were almost going into circles. And then there, uh, Pervez Musharraf's time came. After that, it was Imran Khan who arrived in Pakistani politics. And his whole jargoning was that I'm going to be different. I'm going to bring in something new. We need to get out of these circles. We are going to bring in educated class. We are not going to follow dynastic politics. All that we were going to make people to pay their taxes. Uh, we are going to stand on our own feet. Everything that the youth wanted to hear and the, the ghost generation that I call were the people, like, for instance, when I started doing Pakistani politics, a lot of um, ed people in my family or outside my family or the educated class, they would say, why are you getting involved into politics? It's not something that women should get involved in. This is dirt, dirty politics in Pakistan. That was the conception that had been evolved over the years about politics, that it's dangerous. Uh, and, and you can't blame them. I mean, we've seen our prime, one prime minister being hanged, one exiled. A lot of things happened, but free speech was curtailed. So, so the way things changed, so the Khan arrived, one more thing happened. Pervez Musharraf brought in electronic media. And with electronic media, boom, there was a completely new Pakistan being shown everywhere. And then over the years, we saw electronic media then transform into social media. And I don't think any political party has 
use social media as successfully as PTI has. They have taken a lot of flack for involving a lot of people who they the other parties think don't know how to talk. But what, what Khan did was he gave everyone a chance to give an opinion or to be involved in politics. And that's how a whole generation, which was just going like ghosts in this political spectrum, they started getting involved. That's why I always ask this question that all these uh, minds that are thinking to minus Khan are we going to minus this whole phenomena out of politics also? Because then the other parties started understanding that we have to involve youth. We have to uh, get more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, middle class friendly faces in politics. Um, we, I'll ask other people to talk about it. But we, I, when I was um, at Westminster in England, we did this whole um, thesis on how British politics also changed when Tony Blair came. Uh, in everything. So in, in some way, I, I, I can kind of relate that the way things change over there, uh, and it may not always be for good, but the things were changed here in Pakistan also because of Imran Khan. Yeah. Maria, thank you so much for your insights. It, it's really important to, to have that perspective. I want to go back to Saha Khan now. Saha, looking from the outside and, and the strategic importance of Pakistan, and, and it has been such a strategically important nation state for, for a very long time now, what is the view from the United States and elsewhere about what's going on there at the moment and the consequences of that in a wider geopolitical and strategic sense? Sure. And for you, yeah, that was that was great. And I think uh, you and I may have been at the same rally in uh, 2011. Um, but yeah, um, to your question, um, Francis, um, you know, from the U.S. perspective and what's going on with the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, and, you know, um, uh, Michael Kugelman, um, of course, knows a lot more about this um, th than I would as well. But, um, you know, very briefly, like I think in, in the U.S.'s point of view, I, I think the Biden administration has become very wary of Pakistan. And this is... Um, for a couple of reasons. The first is essentially Imran Khan's anti-Americanism. He's been really anti-American anti -American from, the, from the onset, from his early career. And, and as I mentioned before, some of his criticisms are valid, whereas some of them, um, maybe not so much. And even the story of his whole ouster, him blaming the United States for interfering in Pakistan's uh, domestic politics and issues, and, and even going as far as saying that the Biden administration may have bribed some parliamentarians. I mean, they're not, it's not really based on any, any facts, and there's certainly not any open source data about this. So that said, I think the Biden administration is certainly wary of Pakistan because of the anti-Americanism. Um, another, another reason why sort of the U.S. has kept its distance um, or has not been as engaged as, as I think it should be is because the U.S. has withdrawn from Afghanistan. And the Biden administration is trying to figure out how to engage with the Taliban or how to um, deal with the Taliban being in power in Afghanistan. And, and within Washington, there's a big, there usually is a big struggle in how to deal with Afghanistan and Pakistan separately. Because for so long, it's almost as if it's it's become path dependent, basically. Like they, it, foreign policy officials in DC have become so used to AFPAC, like viewing Afghanistan and Pakistan as the same and with the same lens and, and, and treating them as the same. And, and of course the two very separate countries with very, very different interests as well. Some interests align, but some, some don't. And, and Washington has always struggled with that. And you see this in Biden's policy now where they're really struggling with how to engage with the Taliban. They currently have stopped talks with the Taliban because Ayman al-Zawahiri, who's the leader of Al-Qaeda, was, was found in Kabul and, and killed by a U.S. drone strike. Within D.C., there's been a lot of criticism of the U.S. shouldn't have withdrawn and why why was it a mistake or was it a mistake or not. So Biden is also dealing with some uh, domestic issues as well. But at a fundamental level, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has been poor. And um, I think it'll, it'll continue to be that way. And Imran Khan's anti-American rhetoric um, and some of the misinformation that he's been using, I don't think is going to help Pakistan at all. Michael Kugelman, just to, to follow in behind Sahar on that and the relationship between the major strategic powers a, a, and Pakistan, uh, what's the next step in terms of, well, well let, let's put it this way, depending on which way uh, events unfold in the next little while, uh, what are the consequences if Pakistan remains as politically unstable 
as it seems to be now? Well, thanks. Um, you know, it, I, it's a very uncertain moment, and it's really hard to, uh, to make a prediction. Um, you know, I think that there's certain signposts to be looking for in the coming days. The one is if um, Imran Khan is actually arrested. Uh, you know, that's sort of an open question right now. As, as was mentioned earlier, he got um, free arrest bail, and he next is going to appear in, in, a, in, a, in a court next week. Um, and so we'll have a better sense then. Uh, my sense is that it, at this point, I would think it's unlikely that he would be arrested. Uh, I think that there's a lack of um, consensus within the current government as to whether uh, arresting him is actually the right thing to do. I, I think that there's some 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 leaders there that uh, think that that would be catastrophic uh, in the sense that that could really destabilize the country in the worst possible way because his supporters are not going to sit quietly or would not sit quietly if he were to be arrested. So, But if that were to happen, then you really have to worry about uh, political destabilization in Pakistan and prospects for political violence in in major cities. Um, but uh, it's it's really hard to say because you know as you noted before, as someone noted before, there's so many different things going on, all bad uh, at this point in, in in Pakistan, from this economic crisis to the political uncertainty, uh, and now you have these floods, or which are going to make things uh, even worse. Will we see the government turn its full attention? to f flood recovery. Um, I wouldn't necessarily count on that. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's, it's just very hard to, to, to know where things are going to go at this point. And my sense is that the current government would like to do everything it can to hold on and stay in power at least until this fall, until November, when we have a key moment when um, the current army chief's term is up. Uh, and it's uh, theoretically time for there to be a new army chief appointed. And the current government would like to be in a position to make that call because the army chief is such an important role. The current government would like to make sure that whoever the next army chief is, whether the current chief gets another extension or whether there's someone new, that that person uh, will not be allied with with Imran Khan. That's really important, I think, for for this government uh, to be sure. Um, but uh, and we've seen the government try to make some efforts to stop the bleeding economically. There have been a number of uh, of commitments from from countries to provide uh, essentially bailout funds. I mean, we've heard that um, Oman has has pledged uh, a few billion. I think uh, Qatar has as well. And of course, the, the Pakistanis are really hoping that uh, soon enough, the IMF will give its formal approval of a new IMF package. And that would, that would help to an extent and bring at least a bit more stability to the economy, which at the end of the day is the biggest uh, challenge um, to this point. But, but yeah, obviously, it's a very, potentially it's a very combustible mix in, in Pakistan with the political uncertainty, the economic troubles, the humanitarian disaster of the flooding, and just a lack of not knowing what's going to happen next. And I think that for everyone from neighboring countries to, uh, to to markets around the world, to potential investors, everyone is sort of on edge and not really sure what to do, given that there's just a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen next week or, or next month. Michael, thank you for your participation today. I know you've got to leave us uh, to uh, attend to some other commitments, but we really appreciate you being uh, as part of our conversation here on the Redline Podcast, uh, Twitter Spaces Conversation. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, having me. Great discussion. Michael Kugelman with us here as part of our conversation. A couple more questions before we finish up here, and I want to thank everybody for participating and, and listening tonight. There's so much more we could discuss, but I just want to go back to Derek just quickly on, on the economic situation. I mean, this crisis, Derek, has occurred at the least opportune time. There's no, I mean, there's no opportune time for a crisis of this nature. I mean, this is a particularly acute given the economic situation globally, the post-pandemic economic supply problems and the attendant inflation bubble, which is happening everywhere. And, and the issue for Pakistan, for instance, with uh, Imran Khan's government providing fuel subsidies, which uh, the IMF is seeing as, as unsustainable and probably wants them uh, removed as a precondition for renewing Pakistan's loan program. So while these political uh, uh, tensions and this problem is, is coming to the fore, the really hard-nosed policy decisions still have to be made. Who's making these decisions? Uh, that's that's a, an excellent question, Francis. Um, if you've seen uh, in some of uh, Imran Khan's latest uh, statements that he's made to PTI supporters uh, across the country, he has uh, several times cited the ongoing uh, economic crisis in Sri Lanka 
uh, related to fuel, related to food uh, shortages and lines at the petrol pump for um, auto rickshaws and so forth. And Khan has um, not intimated, he has directly said that the same sorts of problems uh, that are occurring in Colombo and Jaffna and Sri Lanka are going to come to Pakistan if they aren't already there. Um, I think he, you know, the Khan has, uh, I think he's referenced the, inf the massive inflation of the Sri Lankan rupee and, you know, kind of told people at rallies things along the lines that the Pakistan rupee um, could kind of meet that same fate. Uh, and so I think things are looking pretty dire. Pakistan faces um, enormous issues with climate change. Not only is the, um, have the, the floods been going on, which are, I think, the worst I think it was cited that there are the it's the worst flooding since I believe something like 2008. Um, but also, Pakistan is going through a major heat wave. The country has endemic issues with uh, uh, electricity, the electricity grid, um, which in Pakistani English parlance are known as load shedding, um, and that's when in major Pakistani cities, Lahore, Karachi, Peshawar, uh, Quetta, Gilgit, places like uh, uh, Bahawalpur. Um, the electricity is sort of is turned off from time to time. You know, you'll go like with, with this, the, what they call load shedding, electricity will be off for like, say, four hours or something, and everything shuts down from Wi-Fi to, you know, communic communications equipment to, te you know, television and all that kind of thing. And I think that the, the current global um, economic crisis that's going on in the wake of the pandemic um, is only going to exacerbate a Pakistan, which is an already fragile state. Um, I would like to also mention one of the other thing to your your earlier question uh, about um, the Biden administration and their view of what's going on uh, in Islamabad and Rawalpindi today. And I would just like to point out that the Washington's relationship uh, with Islamabad has largely been, and I think this is fairly obvious. Uh, it's in films like Charlie Wilson's war and things like that, but it's, it's historically been transactional in nature um, from the rule of general Zia al um, in the late, from the late seventies until the late 1980s through the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan. Uh, when the CIA was um, funneling Saudi money and American money and with an arms pipeline um, to what are known as the, the seven parties, which are the, the uh, Mujahideen war fighting groups that were based in Peshawar and fighting in, against the Soviet Red Army in Afghanistan, then jumped to post 9-11 and the onset of the war on terror. You had uh, General Perez Musharraf pledging his uh, sort of his support to the Bush administration in the what I would call the uh, you were either with us or you were with the terrorists era of sort of American brutal realpolitik. And so now with the fall of the Ashraf Ghani government in Kabul uh, about a year ago, the United States isn't really sure what the utility of an unstable Pakistan is today. And what I would also like to mention is that the U.S. is kind of balancing its interests in Pakistan, which were largely, let's be honest, related to its interests of war fighting in Afghanistan, with India, which the United States sees as a balance against China. And Pakistan is a conduit of Chinese strategic depth to the, uh, to the Arabian Sea through the Gwadar Project um, and the Karakoram Highway and other things. So I think um, the, from the Biden administration's perspective, I'm not sure the U.S. has, whether the State Department or the Defense Department or the, the, the intelligence community, I'm not sure that the Americans have a holistic sort of strategy in how to deal with a politically, at least for the moment, destabilized nuclear-armed Pakistan. Look, at this point, I think we need to wind things up. We could speak for a lot longer, but uh, for the time being, that's it for this particular conversation. I want to thank everybody who has participated, everyone who is listening. I know there were lots of people who wanted to join the conversation, but we do have limited time and limited space uh, to do this. But we will revisit this particular topic, no doubt, very soon because we are deeply invested in uh, what is happening there. Sahar Khan, uh, Derek, uh, Henry Flood, Michael Hilliard, uh, here, uh, and also Michael uh, Klugman, thank you so much for being 
part of our latest Red uh, Line podcast Twitter Spaces event. My name is Francis Leach. I'm the head of Breaking News with the Red Line podcast. We'll be doing uh, more of these uh, and more frequently as uh, as the, the weeks roll through. Finally, to Michael Hilliard once again, who is the host of the Red Line podcast. Uh, Michael, remind people where they might be able to uh, revisit this conversation uh, and listen to it again. And also, you know, if you enjoyed or got something substantive from the discussion, please share it with your friends and your network so they can hear it too. Michael, where can they go? Uh, you can go to all your usual places like Spotify and iTunes and all the goods, uh, all the usual places. Uh, and we actually just did an entire uh, big piece on, on Baluchistan as well and the uh, Chinese investment in there and, and how Baluchistan's future may sort of destabilize or make uh, Pakistan's future. So you can check that out on there. Uh, but uh, I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head that it was a fantastic panel and, and Fariha and Sahar and Derek and, and Michael were, you know, I, I, if I wasn't speaking on this one, I definitely would be listening anyway because they're all my go-to sources for uh, knowledge on Pakistan anyway. We really appreciate everyone's time. and it, It's been a really uh, satisfying discussion. Thank you for being part of our latest Twitter Spaces event. And until next time, stay well. Bye-bye.